Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith. Having your Bibles this morning, let's open them, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. We began a few weeks ago on a series that we have entitled Imagination, Living Out Your Inner Image. And today we are working on the third part, Numbers 13. And as most of you know, Numbers 13 is the story about the 12 spies who went in to spy out the land that God had promised them. He told them it was a land flowing with milk and honey and that they went in and spied it out. Numbers 13, and we will begin reading with verse number... I've got to get there myself. Here we are. Verse number 26, Numbers 13, 26. Thank you, Lord. All right. Are you hungry today? Amen. You got your fork and your knife? Yes. You got your checkered little napkin over you so you don't get any barbecue sauce on you? Yes. Or steak sauce? <laughs> Here we go. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whether thou sendest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and a very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all those ites Scare the pond water out of us. That's not in there. <laughs> I, that's not one of those newer, newly inspired translations, or nearly inspired translations. Verse 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. I'm looking forward to talking to this man when I get to heaven. I want to sit down and just get a play-by-play -play on this and talk to him. It's going to be so interesting to talk to Caleb. But the men went up with him, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, uh, it's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So many today are like the ten spies. They have faith to come out, but they don't have faith to enter in. And so many Christians are there. We're, we're rejoicing, we are excited and happy that God has brought us out. We're born again, we're not in the world, we're not on our way to hell. And those are some awesome things to be thankful for. But so many Christians are in a holding pattern. They're right there where they believe God that they can come out, but they don't have faith to enter in. And it, it burdens me as a pastor. I want God to use me and to use this series to help people to enter in into what God has for them. Amen? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, there goes four, four thoughts through my mind. I've got to rein myself in. We've got a lot to look at today. They failed to enter in because of their imagination. They had the wrong inner image. They said, we were as grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in the sight of the giants. I seriously doubt that. I don't think any of those men went to a giant and said, excuse me, sir, we're taking a survey. What do you think about us? How do you see us? But because they saw themselves with a the grasshopper mentality, they said, if we see ourselves that way, surely others see us that way. There's no way we can take this city. There's no way we can do this. We're just grasshoppers. So they had the wrong imagination. They had the wrong inner image. Now, this is something here that, that we can get some good insight on. You can tell where your faith is at by what you imagine. This is a great way to locate your faith. You can tell where your faith is at by what you are imagining. There's a lot of ramifications. I think that's a strong statement to, to begin with. 
You can tell where your faith is at by what you're imagining. Well, Brother Phil, I'm not imagining anything. Well, then your faith is not engaged. It's not going to be a quiet session, is it? <laughs> the Lord gave this statement to me this week. I was thinking about the, the spies going in and looking at Numbers 13. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke this to me. He said, they failed to enter in because they didn't see it the way God said it. They didn't enter in because they failed to see it the way God said it. And I had never heard it like that before. And I thought, man, Lord, that's good. Thank you for giving me that nugget. They didn't see it the way he said it. And so we have to stop and pause and ask ourselves, am I seeing it the way he's saying it to me? The promises that God is speaking to me, the words that he's given to me, am I really seeing it the way he's saying it? Am I, do I have the same inner image that God has about me? What he's saying to me, how clear am I seeing it the way he said it? You do not need to picture anything that's contrary to what God is saying to you. In fact, not only, not only that, you should do your best to resist any image, any picture, any imagination that comes to you that's opposite of what God's been speaking to you. That's known as a vain imagination, and those things need to be pulled down. Do not entertain pictures of something that God is saying to you that's right the opposite of that. Hold on to those pictures. I've done this once before. I'm going to do it one more time. I really believe it bears repeating that we've got new people here today. And I believe this is impactful. So I want you to see this and I want you to think about these words. If you can't see your future, you won't have a future. If you can't see your future in God, you're not going to have one. You need to get an image. I'm wearing this ring on my right hand. I am. See those mountains in there? Caleb said, give me my mountain. You see that diamond on the top? The son of righteousness has arisen with healing in his wings. Amen. This ring... On my left hand, that's my covenant ring between me and my wife. This is my covenant ring between me and Jesus. Amen. How clearly do you see your future? If you can't see a future, you won't have one. This is temporary. This is in, in it's on its way. It's happening. I gotta let that set. God's dealing with some folks right now. How clear can you see? How far can you see? What are your inner images you've been entertaining? You've got, <laughs> thank you, Holy Ghost, you've got to be able to see it the way He said it. For Psalms 139, 16, in thy book, pardon me, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, were fashioned, that they were written and they were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I'm not talking transcendental meditation. I'm not talking sitting in a lotus position and trying to empty your mind. I'm talking about filling your mind and your heart with what God is saying. Yeah. Until the image is so real on the inside of you. You empty yourself, somebody will come along and fill it. And his first name starts with a D. Right? Delighting in God's word, both the written and the spoken, through meditation will change your inner image. And it will harness the power of your imagination. Now there, this is something I've not said yet. There are degrees of imagination. 
there are degrees of imagination. Every one of us in this room have an imagination, and that imagination for each and every one of us is at a different level. There are degrees of imagination. Whatever your imagination is at, whatever level it's at, use it. Develop it. Remember last week we showed the black and white picture and then the color? Amen. Wherever you're at, use it. The Holy Spirit will help you to develop your imagination for the things of God. We need to, uh, we need to be proactive in this area. I think Christians when it comes to their imagination, is far more on the defensive and they're not on the offensive and we've got to change that and turn that around where our imagination, we're not always defending and, and accepting the bombardment of the enemy. We've got to be proactive and we've got to get engaged with our mind and our imagination for the things of God. Amen. The Word of God is filled with pictures. Now, that's one of the many, many reasons why I love the King James Bible is because of the verbiage. It is so, there's such poetry. It's so picturesque. It's a great translation to meditate from and to develop your imagination. For those of you that use other translations, you know, if you're going to read them and study them, but if you're going to meditate, I highly recommend that you only use one translation. Because if you get one verse in five different translations and meditate, it's going to confuse you. But if you take just one translation and use it to meditate, and of course I'm using, I recommend the King James, because of the way it was written, it was written, now you may not know this, but this is true, the King James Bible has more single syllable words in it than any other translation, and it has more verses that are made up of single syllable words than any other translation. So it's very easy, there's a cadence, there's a rhythm to the King James Bible that will help you concerning memorization and concerning uh, developing those inner images that God has for you. Hallelujah. Now, you're going to find as you meditate and as you begin to renew your mind and you, you work on your imagination, you're going to find yourself doing something, or maybe I should say not doing something, and that is this. You're going to discover that the world's entertainment does not have its pull on you like it used to. And you're going to find yourself unhooking more and more from the world's entertainment because you found something better. Amen. You found something that really satisfies you and that silly stuff that they got going and the more than silly stuff, the sinful stuff, just doesn't appeal to you anymore because you found something that's satisfying, you found something better, and that's the Word of God. Now, we're going to, at this point, we're going to make a, a transition in this message and in this series. This, this statement I'm going to make is, is a bridge that's going to get us over into something that God has for us for today and for the rest of the, this series. When you meditate the Word sufficiently, you begin to develop an inner image. We know that. We're, we're there. We're at that point. But here's the thing I want you to get. and Here's what I want us to open up with. The clearer that image becomes... The more it acts like an anchor. And it anchors your soul down. I'm going to say that again. The clearer that image becomes, the more it acts like an anchor. And it anchors your soul down. Now we all know that the soul is the, is the battleground. It's the mind, the will, and emotions. That's, that's the area that the devil hits. And so we need something to anchor us down to give us stability. I'm going to give it to you in one, one sentence. I'm going to ask you to write this down. We're going to say it three times because this is really the way, a good way of saying this. The image of the scripture settles you down in the reality of it. Say it after me, please. The image of the scripture... Settles you down in the reality of it. The image of the scripture settles you down in the reality of it. That answers so many questions right there. That, that so helps us understand why there's people, I, I, I call it roller coaster Christianity. They're up, 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 then they're down, down, down. One day they're on fire for Jesus, and by Wednesday they need to go to the altar and pray because they're backslid. 
I mean, it's just this massive up and down, highs and lows, and there's no stability. Why is that? They go to church, they, they give money in the plate, they love Jesus, there's no doubt about that. But there's such highs and lows, and they're so moved by how they feel. They're moved by the circumstances. Where's the stability? It's because they can't see what God is saying. Amen. They're not seeing it. And that image, the clearer it becomes, the more it will anchor you down. Read with me, please, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. The image of the Scripture settles you down in the reality of it. Hebrews 6. Now I'm compelled at this point to remind you, for those of you that have heard, especially the first message, that your imagination is not a part of your soul. It's in your spirit. Your, your imagination is in your spirit and it connects to your soul i got to do this real quick. There are five functions to your spirit, man. There's conscience, intuition, communion, imagination, and searching. Well, the Bible tells us that our spirit and our soul are intertwined. They're always connected. They're never separated. When you leave your body, you'll be separated from your body, but your spirit and soul go together. Well, those five functions, conscience, intuition, communion, imagination, and searching... The two functions that come out of your spirit that keep your soul attached to your spirit is your conscience and your imagination. So we're dealing with the thoughtful intent of the heart. It's one thing for the devil just to throw a random thought in your head and you get a picture and you go, okay, that clearly wasn't of me. I remember years ago the devil gave me a thought. And I just stopped, and I, and I said out loud, I said, you know what, you really got issues. Because <laughs> I would have never thought of that on my own, ever. That was just so bizarre and out there. And I said, you really got issues, don't you? There is no way I'm going to accept that thought. That is so crazy. How many of you know the devil's got some serious issues? <laughs> right? He's got some issues. What's that? Yeah, loser issues. That's right. He's got some major loser issues. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Let's do that again. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immobility of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the, uh, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I know there was a lot in there. When you meditate in the Word, you develop the spiritual force of hope. When you meditate in the Word of God, you develop the spiritual force of hope. Faith is a spiritual force for your spirit. Hope is a spiritual force for your soul. And love is a spiritual force for your body so you don't hit people in the head. Because they're knuckleheads. Right? Love is to help restrain you. <laughs> Paul said, the love of God constraineth us. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. Because there are people you want to do the laying on of hands suddenly. <laughs> right? Don't worry, it's all right. We believe in healing. We'll take care of you after we've knocked you out. <laughs> Amen. So, for, so hope, 
works on the soul. It works on the mind, the will, and emotions. And what, what do we say in this series? We said that hope is positive imagination. Hope is the new covenant word for imagination. It's the positive aspect of imagination. Hope is a positive imagination. And along with that is expectation. Would you agree with that? Amen. Okay, praise God. Three of you and the rest of you are processing. This hope, this positive imagination is set before us and it's in the Word of God. God has given us a Bible small enough to hold in our hands, great enough to study for a lifetime, and rich enough to satisfy our hearts and our mind forever. Amen. Only God can do that. Only God could do that. Don't you love the Holy Bible? Amen. Where would we be without it? My, my. Oh, if people would just take the Word of God as serious as they do their problems. Amen. Years ago, Lee and I were at uh, Believer's Convention in Fort Worth with Kenneth and Gloria. And on Saturday, we went to, to Gloria Copeland's Healing School. And so then we went forward for prayer. And I'm in line. And there's a lady next to me. And then Leanne's on my right. And so the prayer minister is coming down. And so he comes up to the lady next to me. And, and I'm endeavoring to concentrate on the Lord. And I hear her say to the man, this is serious. You understand me? And she was an older lady. And he was a younger man. She said, you understand me, young man? This is serious. If people would take the word of God just as serious as they do their problems. Nothing is serious in the light of the power of God. Amen. Because everything's fixable. Everything's changeable in the power, in the light of God's power. But too many people take their problems serious and they treat the Word of God lightly. Yeah, amen. amen. Hope gives us full assurance, but hope has to be laid hold of. Hope isn't just something that's going to fall on you. It's not just going to be something that happens. You have to take it. You have to lay hold of that hope that's in the word that will act like an anchor and settle you down. And so when that happens, you know, the, the poo's hitting the fan. Everything's a chaos and a mess around you. And people look at you and go, now how can you be so calm? I don't think you're taking your problems as serious as you should. <laughs> you should be worried about this. This does not look good. And on the inside, you're calm and cool because hope has anchored you down because you have a positive imagination and you're expecting God to come on the scene at any moment. Amen. Right? right? Oh, praise God. Hope will work. Let me say it to you a totally opposite and different way. Hopelessness causes faint-heartedness. Hopelessness causes faint-heartedness. One of the earmarks of our, of our society today is its hopelessness. People have no hope. And that's absolutely crazy. Even in the natural, that's crazy because we live in America. We're still the best. We got a lot of problems, I understand, but we're still the best ship that's floating on the ocean. Amen. There's still opportunities in this nation. Last time I checked, McDonald's and Walmart are still hiring. I know that's not top of the ladder, but you can start somewhere and work your way up, right? Even in the natural, but people have just checked out and they're just so hopeless. And hopelessness causes faint-heartedness. There's no positive imagination. Powerful scripture is in Colossians 1.23. Colossians 1.23. This is a powerful, powerful scripture. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Yeah, I'll let you turn there. We'll read it again. This is so powerful and so enlightening. 
Colossians 1.23, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. We're not to be moved away from the hope of the gospel, right? Amen. We're not to. And yet so many have. Do not be moved away from the inner image that the word produces. Do not be moved away from the inner image that the word produces. And yet we have mass amounts of people that have moved away from the hope of the gospel. Do not be moved away from the inner images that the word produces. One of the biggest indicators, one of the biggest indicators that we have moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's not going to be the typical answer you're, you're thinking. Boredom. Boredom. You can tell when you have been moved away from the hope of the gospel is because of boredom. I have never met more people in my life that say I'm bored out of my gourd. I'm just bored. I'm bored. Why are you bored? What is up with that? Hope is the antidote for boredom. Amen. Amen. Hope is the antidote for boredom. Now, I, I got some things I need to say today. So I, I want you to hear the heart of a pastor. I am not here to knock anybody down. I'm not here to slam anybody. That, that is not my intention. That's not my spirit. And I want you to hear my heart. I want you to hear the, the tone of my voice today because I got some strong things to say. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians, speaking the truth in love, we grow up. Amen. Speaking truth will not cause you to grow up. Speaking truth in love will cause you to grow up. But, but, true, but love without truth is not love. It's not just truth that causes you to grow up. It's love and truth, speaking the truth in love. But love without truth isn't love either. So I got some things to say and, and just hear the heart of the pastor, okay? And besides that, I'm not calling out your name. So if you just look straight ahead, nobody will know. <laughs> right? And then you can go home, fall across your bed and go, oh, God, that was me. <laughs> but you're, you're cool if you just look straight ahead. Let me tell you something. Boredom is a big indicator that we have no hope, that we've left it. And boredom reveals that our priorities are out of order. If you're bored, your priorities are out of order. I can't tell you when was the last time I was bored. I'm too busy to be bored. I got a full life. I love my wife. I love my family. I love Jesus. I got things to do. I've got a call of God in my life. I've got a vision. As you can tell, I've got a vision. There's no time to be bored. And so if you're bored, you need to stop and assess your priorities. If I just begin to feel the least little bit of boredom, I stop and go, okay, what am I doing? Because my priorities aren't right. No Christian should ever experience boredom. Amen. Thank you. Somebody give that man $5. You shouldn't. If we are properly engaging our imagination and feeding the Word and meditating on the Word, we'll never experience boredom and our priorities will be straight. Now, <laughs> here's another one. <laughs> I need a pulpit because this isn't big enough to hide behind. <laughs> <laughs> if your life is a mess, it's because you conceived it in your imagination. If your life is a mess, it's because you conceived it in your imagination. And, and we live in the society of the blame game. It, I'm the victim. You don't understand. It's my circumstances. It's my circumstances. If your life is a mess, it's because you have conceived it in your imagination. Your imagination is like soil. It'll produce whatever you plant in it. 
My wife has a garden. Can you imagine her going to that garden and she puts some tomato seeds in there and the ground spits it back out and go, oh no. Mm -mm. You planted tomatoes here for the last three years, bring us some cucumbers. We're done with this tomato business. <laughs> Soil will produce whatever you put in it. Your imagination will produce whatever you put in it. You have the choice, right? right, right. Hmm. Unrestrained thoughts are building blocks to strongholds. Unrestrained thoughts are building blocks to strongholds. You know, this, this wall, it was built one brick at a time. Every brick, unrestrained thought, unrestrained thought, unrestrained thought, unrestrained thought. Unrestrained thoughts are building blocks to strongholds. You guys are doing good. I got just one more. Depression. Depression is another big indicator of no hope. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Depression is selfishness. Depression is selfishness. You are being self-centered if you're struggling with depression. You got you on your mind. There's no way you can have your mind on Jesus, what he did for you at Calvary's cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. He's seated at the Father's right hand. He ever lives to make intercession for you. You cannot be thinking those thoughts and be depressed. Amen. Depression is selfishness. You are being self-centered. But Phil, you don't know my problems. You're right. Guess what? You don't know mine either. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got problems. And there are people who think, well, when I get rid of my problems, then I'll be happy. <laughs> really now? Well, have I got a revelation for you? Only in heaven will you not have any problems. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. She's got problems. She's too young to know she's got problems, but she's got problems. She does. Everybody has problems. Well, Phil, because of my problems, I'm depressed. No, you're depressed because you're selfish. You're not walking by faith. You're not living in the Word. You've got your eyes on yourself and your circumstances. We have been moved away from the hope of the gospel. You cannot be filled with positive imaginations, expect a great future in God, and be depressed. Just not going to happen that way. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. One of the worst things you can do is feel sorry for yourself. Lee and I were talking about someone a week or so ago. No one here. Don't worry about it. And she goes, I feel sorry for so-and-so. And I said, I don't. And, and she said, well, how come? I said, because that person feels sorry enough for the both of us. <laughs> She's got me and her and a few other people covered because she feels so sorry for herself. I don't need to. Yeah. One of the worst things you can do is feel sorry for yourself. But Phil, my situation, what about mine? Didn't know you have any. That's my point. <laughs> filled with hope, filled with joy. Amen? Amen? Well, then, if I'm not going to be bored, and if, you know, if I'm not going to be depressed and feel sorry for myself, what am I going to do? You're going to do Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. Oh, dear Lord, I love this verse of Scripture. Romans 15, 13. Isn't it said that we live in such a medicated society? Yeah. Medicated, medicated, medicated. 
I love what the Lord told me years ago. He said, meditate until you don't have to medicate. Amen. Amen. Just meditate until you don't have to medicate anymore. Because the word is health to all our flesh. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope the God of positive imagination, fill you with all joy and peace in believing, now watch this, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Not only, only are we to have hope, we are to abound in hope. We're to have an extra large measure of positive imagination coupled with expectation. We're to abound in it. Isn't that an awesome verse? Glory to God. We're to abound in this. The Holy Spirit was sent to help you with your imagination. Amen. Oh, I like that. The Holy Spirit was sent by God to help you with your imagination. He has come to assist you to paint a new picture on the canvas of your heart. You're not in this alone. You have supernatural help. The Holy Ghost is here to help you paint a new picture on the canvas of your heart. Thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Let's talk about four of the four areas that break down meditation. Before I do that, I, the Lord wants me to back up. I got I to gotta deal with something I thought was done, but I need to do this. Can you imagine next Sunday coming to church and it's like, well, where's Brother Phil? Where's Phil? He's home. He's home. Yeah, he's in bed. Got the covers up over his head. How come? He's depressed. He's depressed. Oh, poor brother Phil. Don't you feel sorry for him? Yeah, let's gather around and pray for our pastor. And I'm home going, <laughs> the people, the people just what do they expect from me? <laughs> they probably want a 15-minute sermon in a warm building. <laughs> We live in a generation of whiny babies. Just whiny babies. Get your thumb out and grow up. What kind of pastor is that? That's known as pastor pathetic. Just pastor pathetic. What church do you go to? Pastor pathetic's church. He suffers depression, always feeling sorry for himself. The crowd was low, so he was low. We've got to get a lot of people in so he can be up next week. You know, he just really suffers with selfishness because it's all about him. I hope you never find out about my problems. But if you ever do, I want you to go, you know what? He comes in with a smile on his face. He laughs in every sermon. He's full of the joy and peace of God. Now, there's a man I can respect, and there's a man I can follow, because he's got yeah. those problems. Let me tell you something about people. They're going to do one of two things. They're going to either feel sorry for you, or they're going to respect you, but they're not going to do both. Yeah. You don't want people to feel sorry for you. You want them to respect you. Amen. Right? Right? Four things about meditation. The first one is ponder. To ponder the scriptures. Ponder. P. Ponder. Ponder the scriptures. Which means you think about it over and over again, right? You ponder it. The second one is picture. You picture it. Ponder. Picture. The third one is personalize. Ponder, picture, personalize. And number four, perform. Perform it. Ponder, picture, personalize, and perform. How many of you know that in the final analysis, only the doers of the word are blessed? You can read, you can study, but all of, this, all of this pondering, picturing, and personalizing puts you in a position to be a doer of the Word. Mm -hmm. If you don't do the Word, if you don't perform it, the rest is really obsolete. And that's what separates the whiny babies from the people that are growing up. 
Ponder it till you can picture it, till you can see it. And then personalize it and then go out and perform it. Say that with me, please. Say ponder, ponder. picture, picture. Personalize. personalize, perform. I believe that the Holy Ghost is sent to help you do those four things. He's sent to help you do those four things. Okay, thank you, Holy Ghost. When, when a minister is preaching, he does things, he says things to, to prove a point and to bring a point home. The thing that I find difficult is when you do that, then there's the concern of people taking that to an extreme and then they, they get rid of other stuff such as what I'm talking about is this. Even though I've talked about depression, being selfishness, and, and things like that, I'm not saying that you can't come to me with your problems. I'm not saying that. Okay? I'm not saying that at all. I'm a pastor. That's what I'm here for. And if you come to me, I am not... Can I have your hand? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go. Precious, precious, precious. I just feel so sorry for you. I don't know what Jesus is going to do about that. That's, oh, precious, precious, precious. I'm not going to do that. This is a true story. I went to a lady one time and told her my problem. She grabbed, grabbed my hand and she went, precious, precious. And this is what she said. She goes, it'll probably get worse before it gets better. What kind of counsel is it's going to get worse before it gets better? I learned real quick. I got to be more selective who I share my problems with, man. You come to me with your problem, I'm going to grab your hand and I'm going to say, now the word of God says. Amen. And I want to give you three or four verses and we're going to grab hands and we're going to believe God for this until... And we're going we're gonna to release our faith. Not it's going to get worse before it gets better. Y'all going to go home going, precious, precious, <laughs> precious, aren't you? <laughs> First Chronicles 29, please. First Chronicles 29. We could have named it precious. We could have named this sermon precious, precious, precious. First Chronicles 29. When you're raised in church, there's a lot you experience. First Chronicles 29 is um, a chapter about King David, and he's going to transition the kingdom over to Solomon. And David, as you know, had a heart for God and wanted to build the temple. And so the Lord spoke to him and said, David, you can't build my temple. You've been a man of war, been a man of bloodshed. But your, so your son Solomon is going to build my temple. But what the Lord did for, for David was this, and David, David tells you that the Holy Ghost came upon him and in writing gave him the, the picture of the temple. So the blueprint came from God to David, and David handed the blueprints over to his son Solomon. But the other thing that David did was that he began to save up his money, and he brought an offering to the Lord to help out in, in the funding of the building project. And if you study, actually, the, the offering was over a billion dollars of what David brought out of his own personal bank account, okay? And others brought, and it was just magnificent. And so this is a, a really a, a great chapter, and then David starts to pray a prayer, and he's praying it, and we're going to pick up on verse 16, 1 Chronicles 29, 16. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand, and all is thine own. So he was recognizing that even though he had brought such a large offering, God, it came from you. It didn't come from me. It's, it's coming through me, but it came from you. And so he's given God the acknowledgement and the credit for that. Verse 17, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in, un, in uh, uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. So everybody got involved in this offering. Now look at verse 18. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of, of, of Israel, 
our fathers. Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. Now, once again, every time we see the word imagination in the Bible, we see the word heart. The imagination is the thoughtful intent of the heart. David prays, God, take this offering, take this billion dollar plus offering and keep it forever in the imagination of the hearts of your people. Now, that's, that's a prosperity message there that I won't, I won't touch on, but that's, that's really awesome. But there's some powerful things here that we can see, and they're this. There is no way that you can really know the ways of God apart from your heart being involved. If you really want to know God and know the things of God, the ways of God, your heart has to be engaged. Amen. Have you ever met the person that had, well, they were what I call a brainiac? They had such biblical information, but they kept their heart closed to the Lord. They could tell you how many steps that Jesus took from point A to point B, the temperature of the day, what, wind, what way the wind was blowing, and all of the external stuff, but they wouldn't let God deal with their heart. If you're going to really know God, you have to yield your heart to Him. I give myself away. Right? The heart has to be involved. Everything that is in your heart must first go through your imagination. Everything that's in your heart must first go through your imagination. Both, both ways. I, I, I see it like a two-way street. What's in your heart, in order for it to get out into the natural, has to come through your imagination. In order for something to get into your heart, it has to go through your imagination because your imagination is the gateway to your spirit. Your imagination is the gateway to your spirit. You can tell what's going on in your heart by looking at your imagination. You don't need to fast and pray for three days and say, Oh God, expose my heart to me. Show me what's in my heart. Just look at your imagination. Oh, it's quiet in this place. Imagination, the thoughtful intent of the heart. God deals with this on a heart level and He sees our imagination. So God is going to have to deal with this concerning our imagination. At some point in your Christian life, God is going to come over and he's going to tap you on the shoulder and he's going to begin to deal with you with your imagination because he's dealing with your heart. This is not a mind game. This is the thoughtful intent of the heart. And David said, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of the people, of thy people. Powerful prayer, wasn't it? You cannot remember without an imagination. You cannot remember without an imagination. What did he pray? The wording of this. Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people. You cannot remember without an imagination. Your ability to remember is tied to your imagination. Your ability to remember is tied to your imagination. People who say, I just can't remember scriptures, is letting you know something about themselves. They may be reading and studying, but they're not meditating. They're not meditating. They're not pondering, and they're not picturing. It's amazing. Those same people can give you all kinds of stats on sports, hunting, whatever they, that they're into. But as far as why well, I just can't remember Scripture. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I'm going to prove it to you. You cannot meditate without using your imagination. That's extremely important. You cannot meditate without using your imagination. <laughs> how many here, by a show of hands, you know how to worry? Does anybody here know how to worry? Come on. 
You know how to worry? If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Because that's what worry is. Worry is meditation, but it's meditating on the lies of the enemy, not the truth of God's word. And when you're worrying, think about that. When you worry, what do you do? You loop it. You loop it. You go over the same thing again and again and again. And so what are you doing? You're pondering. And so you keep doing it until what? You can now picture it. You can see it happening. And when it gets to that point and you're worried and you keep looping it, what's going to happen? It's going to affect your emotions. Yes. It's going to affect the way you feel. As opposed to being anchored with the truth of God's word, you're now sporadic and erratic and you're full of anxiety and worry and fear and you're wringing your hands. You're doing the exact same thing. You're just doing it in the wrong and opposite direction. So if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. And to meditate in the Word, if you're not engaging your imagination, you're not meditating. You're reading and studying. You're listening to good CDs. You're taking down notes. But you've got to learn to ponder, picture, personalize, and perform. You've got to loop it over and over again until you can see it, until it anchors you down. I'll take an amen right there. Amen. Thank you. So, your ability to remember is tied to your imagination. <laughs> so, there's a, a husband and wife, and they're driving down the road. And the, 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 rec, the radio's playing, and all of a sudden there comes on a song. And he goes, because <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> that was the song that was playing when he had his first serious romantic kiss. And he's, <clears throat> <clears throat> she looks over and goes, baby? What's wrong? Is there something in your throat? Let's put on some praise and worship. <laughs> Memory, imagination, and your emotions. Right? <laughs> there are two things you must successfully deal with in order to grow spiritually. You must deal with your memory... That's your past. And you must deal with your imagination. And that's your future. If you're really going to grow spiritually, you're going to have to deal with your memory, which is your past. And you're going to have to deal with your imagination, which is your future. Did you know you can sin with your memory? You can. You can sin with your memory. You can, you can go back in time and think about something you did. Or you can think about something that was done to you, and you can sin with your memory. You can also sin with your imagination. So if you can sin with your imagination, you can do righteousness with your imagination. You can do some holiness with your imagination, right? Stop replaying your past. Start preplaying your future. Stop pre-playing your past. Start pre-playing your future. The Apostle Paul said, man, there's one thing I got down. It's this, forgetting those things that are behind. I press forward. We all have a past. We all, we've all done dirt. We've all missed God. We've all come short. Even me. I know it's a shock. <laughs> got saved at five, called to preach at eight, preached my first sermon at 12, filled with the Holy Ghost at 12. But I've still done my dirt. Right. We all got a past. And I can sit and think about what was done wrong to me. And I can think about the neighbor lady who molested me as a little boy. And I can be emotionally gimp for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Or I can get in the word. Amen. Right? right? You cannot, uh, this is disappointing. You cannot crucify the devil and cast out your flesh. Wouldn't it be nice if you could crucify the devil and cast out your flesh? It doesn't work that way. You crucify your flesh and you cast out the devil. We're, we're just about to close. Years ago, God was dealing with me about meditation, and he spoke this to me. He said, son, meditation on God's word causes the issues of life to be dealt with. Amen. Meditation on God's word causes the issues of life to be dealt with. 
I, I, it saddens me, and I, I know I've been using that term. I've got to change my terminology there. You're going to think I go around sad all the time. But Christians who love God have all these problems, and there's so many books at the bookstore that give false answers. If we would teach people how to really meditate in the Word and engage that imagination, as you meditate in the Word, God will heal you on the inside. Our last nugget. What deliverance takes out, discipline keeps out. Amen. What deliverance takes out, discipline keeps out. That tells me this. I can go to church. I can go to a Holy Ghost church and have somebody lay hands on me. And I can get delivered. And I'm thankful for those things. But once it comes out, if I don't discipline myself to get in this book and fill myself with the truths of this holy word, it's going to come back seven times worse. Jesus. Jesus. Or I can go to the holy word of God first and let that cleanse me and flush me out and, and cause that word come in me and drive that evil spirit out. Either way I go, either at the front end of it or at the back end, I still got to get attached and fall in love with the Word of God. Yeah. What deliverance takes out, discipline keeps out. And that's one of the things in our type of services. We believe in the Holy Ghost, laying on the hands, falling out. We believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit. We've experienced it. I've had people lay hands on me and the power of God flow through me, been delivered, but I knew I had to get in that book. Or it was going to come back. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this today? Yes. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us today. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you so much for listening to this message today and being a part of the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe. <laughs>